God is good, and all the time, God is good. Our first lesson is from Psalm 85. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You've pardoned all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God, of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, so that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant your salvation. Let me hear what God, the Lord, will speak, for he will speak peace to his people to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. From Luke's Gospel, chapter 11, beginning verse 1. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to a time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend. And you go to him at midnight and said, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked. My children are with me in bed. I, I cannot give up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not give up, get up and give him anything, because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. For everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you, if your child asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if a child asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you've ever played King of the Mountain when you were a little kid, you understand how hard it is to win the title of King of the Mountain and keep it. Uh, the rules of the childish game are very simple. You find your mountain. It can be an old abandoned car, it can be a fence post, anything higher than the you know, surrounding area in the near vicinity where you park yourself at the top and you try to keep that position while everybody else tries to knock you off. And uh, it's a dumb game, I know. But how many of us haven't played this throughout our lives? Now, being one of the smallest guys in my neighborhood when I was growing up, I discovered it was pretty easy for me to dislodge the king of the mountain. But when I tried to take his place, I couldn't keep it very long because there was always a kid out there bigger than me, stronger, and he was able to dethrone me real quick. Um, I was just never big or bad enough to keep the title. Now, on our spiritual journey, I've discovered that it's hard for any of us to stay on top of the world forever at least under our own power. Life happens, and the enemy usually has very little resistance when it comes to knocking us off our thrones and sending us sprawling, a simple phone call that we weren't expecting. Bad news of any sort can knock us off our high horses in very short order. At some point, every one of us has to discover that we aren't as tough as we once thought that we might have been. Now, with this in mind, the, the psalmist pleads, Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Now, spiritually speaking, I, I think it's pretty impossible 
for any of us to remain on top of the mountain without a lot of help from on, on high. I believe that's why Jesus himself withdrew to a place by himself so that he could be alone in prayer to his Father. Um, for Jesus, this was key in staying on top of our game, not being so vulnerable to the constant attack of our, our enemies. Now, in our second lesson, it dawned upon the disciples that Jesus took his prayer time very seriously. He was praying in a certain place, and after he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. Now, the first order of business for any disciple is, of course, to be like their master. Um, it would have been awful hard for any of the disciples not to see that Jesus had several legs up on any of them uh, in just about every way. Things didn't rattle him like it did them. Um, he was always so prepared, always so in charge of every situation. In their time with him, they noticed Jesus always seemed to undergird everything he did in prayer. And so in his teaching on prayer, Jesus began with an intimate direct address to our Father in Heaven. Now, in his instruction, Jesus gets right to the point, reverently, respectfully. And with great honor, he addressed his Father in Heaven. And then he makes five requests. Now, the first two deal with, you know, God, God's interest. First request is that God's name be hallowed above all other names. Now, according to Jesus, true prayer has to be directed to the one that is above all others. Now, when we approach our Father in prayer, we are not re approaching anybody remotely, even on our own level. Now, we're approaching the throne room of grace of the sovereign God of the entire universe. And this can only be done with the greatest respect and only in an attitude of honor. Now, the second request is, your kingdom come. Now, true prayer is always undergirded by the thought that what we are asking about really isn't primarily about us. Uh, it never will be. It can't be. It's only about how our God's plans fit into our life. Actually, vice versa, how our plans fit into God's plan, not only for our lives, but also for, you know, the use God has for us in it. We simply can't be the king of our own mountain and seriously approach God in a reverent attitude of prayer. Now, the third request is for our daily bread. Now, bread is a general term denoting, you know, anything that nourishes us, provides sustenance, like, you know, food. It's not a fervent prayer uh, for chocolate cake or cream-filled donuts. It's a prayer for what we need to continue or at least become God's hands and feet in the world in which we live. To become part of God's purposes and His plans. The request for our daily bread is a request to be prepared for the tasks that the Lord has for us and also the strength to finish the job. Now, the fourth request concerns the relationship we have with our God. God is holy. We probably are not, at least at all times. We might have a hint of sin, a stain of sin upon our lives. So in order for us to have full fellowship with our God who is holy, we have to be forgiven. We have to become pardoned for the ways in which we have fallen short of the glory of our God. Now, in asking for the forgiveness of sin, we express our faith that God can and will forgive us. Now, as evidence of our faith in God, we do something in return. We forgive others. Now, the fifth request is, you know, God, don't lead us into temptation. In this life, we have to acknowledge just how vulnerable we are to the devil's schemes for dethroning us as devoted and, and true servants of our God. I mean, the devil's pretty crafty. Now, in this request that we're not led into temptation, we're humbly pleading with our God not to be tested beyond our ability to remain holy and true and faithful to our God. 
Now the bottom line is we're praying to be delivered from those situations in which the enemy's tricks, you know, he, he tricks us into crossing over the line. We don't even realize we're doing it at the time. And we cross over the line into willful disobedience to our God. Therefore, as followers of Christ, we need to ask God for help in order to live a righteous life. Now, in my own King of the Mountain days, as a baby Christian, I used to pray for the strength and, and for the courage to be able to live my life, to be such a life and such a witness in God's kingdom that it would be like throwing snowballs right at the devil. Um, what a stupid prayer. I mean, seriously. Talk about delusions of King me. I mean, I'm certain I am never going to be prepared to go head to head with the devil without a whole lot of help without on high. I mean, the devil is smarter than me. He, he, he's got infinitely more weapons in his bag of tricks than I could ever begin wrapping my mind around. He's got me beat from where go. While you and I try to honor God by playing by the rules that are spelled out in Scripture, Satan and those that follow him, they couldn't care less about any biblical code of ethics. When they look at us, they just rub their hands together thinking, ha, what an easy score. Now on our own, we don't pose much of a problem. We don't offer much resistance at all. What we need to remember is the wisdom that God shared with us in the first epistle. And he writes, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you'll know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now is already in the world. Little children, you are from God, and have conquered them. For the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Anyone that ever tries going it alone is always going to be easy pickings for the enemy. They gang up on us. Now the disciples realize this, and that's why they asked Jesus to teach him how to pray. Now, what the call, what we call the Lord's Prayer, is actually a very excellent model for how we should pray. Um, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, it's a constant reminder for us to seek shelter from the one who can save us from all of our adversaries. Who, you know, that guy's very much like a hungry lion, roaming, roaming to and throw throughout the earth looking for somebody easy, like you and me to devour. Now, as Jesus taught his disciples, prayer for us needs to be a lifestyle, not a get out of trouble, quick Hail Mary that we throw to God, you know, in the, at the gates of heaven when we realize, you know, we're not on top anymore. Uh, deliberately, Jesus says to us, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who searches, finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Now, our Father in heaven is not some guy that refuses to get out of bed to answer the door after lights have gone out. He's not so unfeeling that he'd ever give us a snake for a snack when we ask for a fish sandwich. You know, He's not going to drop a scorpion down our back when we ask for scrambled eggs. I mean, our Father knows what we need even before we even think to be asking. Like the song we sing during our Saturday night service. He's a good, good Father. That's just who He is. And we have been loved by Him. Now the problem for us is it's always been impossible for God to fill our cup when it's already full of something else. Our Father in Heaven loves us so much that He's not going to push us around. He's not going to slap our hands to get us to empty our cup. He loves us so much that He gives us the freedom of our own choice. And he allows us the freedom to want, to throw out all that disgusting stuff that we might have in our cup so that he might fill it. 
that he might fill it with new life. And the right stuff that is our birthright, our true birthright in Christ Jesus. If we're willing to do our part, we can rest assured God is going to do the rest. Now, when it comes to our own personal revival, the, the psalmist, I think, had it right. I'll close with these words. Surely salvation is at hand for those who fear Him, that His glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground. Righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good. Our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before Him and will make a path for our steps. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we're praying, Lord, for the heart of a servant. This trying to be king of our own mansions, it doesn't work real good when there's always somebody else trying to rob and steal and break in. And we've got a crafty ringleader named Satan who knows all the right things to do in order to draw us away from safety, the safety of your love covering of your glory upon our lives. Help us, Lord, to hide our hearts in you. Remind us, Lord, that we're not strong enough to go it alone against the one that can steal the joy of our salvation. Remind us, Lord, that we truly are kings of the mountain when you were lifting us up. And we are kings of the mountain in order to serve you, King Most High. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.